Welcome to Business Communication. In Chapter 1, we'll discuss establishing a framework for business communication. That framework includes defining communication, describing its purpose in business, and understanding the communication process. You'll learn the objectives of communication, the five levels of communication, and the direction that information flows within an organization. And you'll consider how ethical and legal restraints, diversity issues, changing technology, and a team environment can act as strategic forces that shape the framework of communication. Groups within an organization are formed to achieve specific goals, but they must also devote energy to maintaining relationships within the group. The larger the group, the more that interpersonal relationships must be maintained. There are two purposes of group communication. Achievement, or task purpose. Group members may be expected to be part of a decision-making team or problem-solving group and will be expected to get the job done. Maintenance or social purpose. Group communication helps to develop group morale, to make group members feel better about themselves. This communication helps to improve individual members from a behavioral point of view. Effective business communication is essential to success in today's work environments. Communication is the process of exchanging meaning or a message between two or more parties known as senders and receivers. The communication process model illustrates this exchange with a sender encoding the message and choosing an appropriate channel or medium for transmitting the message. Various barriers can interfere with the communication process, including physical distractions, mental distractions, and characteristics of both sender and receiver. Feedback, either verbal or nonverbal, occurs when the receiver successfully decodes the message and responds to the sender. An important component of effective communication is choosing a communication channel or medium for transmitting the message in a suitable form. Communication channels include two-way face-to-face, two-way not face-to-face, and one-way not face-to-face. Two-way face-to-face communication allows for instant feedback. Nonverbal signals can enhance or detract from the communication. A face-to-face -face meeting is a more appropriate channel for sending sensitive or unpleasant messages. Two-way not face-to-face -face communication, such as telephone conversations and instant messaging, allows for instant feedback. However, the significance of nonverbal signals is very limited. One-way, not face-to-face -face communication includes written messages, voicemail, and web pages. This type of communication does not allow instant feedback and makes use of minimal nonverbal signals. Written documents are required when legal matters are involved or written records must be maintained. The receiver may misunderstand the message if an inappropriate communication channel is used. For a complex subject, the sender might start with a written document and follow up with a face-to-face -face discussion. Ineffective communication may result from interferences or barriers to the communication process. Both senders and receivers need to be aware of interferences that can occur at any stage of the communication. Barriers can include different levels of education between the sender and the receiver, different cultural backgrounds, or life experiences. Physical barriers may be noise, uncomfortable room temperatures, and even distracting gestures and movements. These barriers may distract from the accurate communication of a message. Preoccupation, frustration, anger, anxiety, and even simultaneous formulation of the response to the message are also examples of barriers. Communication involves sending messages to both large and small audiences within and outside the organization. 
communication with an intended audience can take place on five levels. Group communication involves more than two people, a team, a committee, a club, the students in a class. Groups are formed so that the combined efforts of all can accomplish more than the individuals themselves. Organizational communication can solve problems when groups that are unable to accomplish goals on their own join forces to achieve a larger objective. Public communication takes place when an organization reaches out to its public to achieve its goals. Channels for public communication include media advertisements and corporate websites. Intrapersonal communication, or self-talk, is how individuals process information based on their own experiences. Interpersonal communication takes place when two people communicate with each other. Their goals are to, one, accomplish the task at hand, and two, feel better about themselves because of the communication. Most business communication with colleagues will fall into this category. Communication channels used in organizations include both formal and informal channels. Management creates formal channels, rules, procedures, and policies to control individual and group behavior and to achieve organizational goals. Within this system, people must act in certain ways to get their jobs done. Informal channels develop as people interact with each other within the formal external system in order to create a satisfying environment. These channels are continually changing. One important informal communication channel is the grapevine. Some consider the grapevine to be speedy but ineffective and inaccurate. They think it is similar to the game telephone, where the message passes and changes from one person to the next until it reaches the end of the line. Actually, the grapevine is no more or less accurate than other communication channels, and it broadcasts messages in a network process rather than a linear process. Even though management does not create the grapevine and other informal communication channels, managers must learn to use these channels to communicate with employees. They should understand how employees communicate among themselves. Managers exercise control and coordination by the direction that information flows. The flow of information within an organization can be downward, upward, or horizontal. Downward communication flows from supervisor to employee, from policy makers to operating personnel, in other words, from top to bottom on the organization chart. Information may include policies and procedures, organizational goals and strategies, and work assignments. Downward communication defines employee development through job roles and assignments, performance appraisals, constructive criticism, and recognition. Upward communication generally is feedback to downward communication, such as responses to management requests for information. Upward communication keeps management informed about employees' attitudes, results and accomplishments, and problems that need clarification. Employees should realize that upward communication can be risky. Upward communication may be misleading if employees tell superiors only what the supervisors want to hear. Horizontal or lateral communication describes communication between people or organizational units that are on the same level. Though not often included on flowcharts depicting organizational chain of command, it is the primary means of coordinating functions within an organization. Horizontal communication is especially important within companies that use cross-functional work teams. Communication is a complicated process influenced by many forces at work in the environment. An effective communicator must consider each of these influences and then structure communication accordingly. Four strategic forces that influence business communication are legal and ethical constraints, 
diversity challenges, changing technology, and team environment. Legal and ethical constraints act as a strategic force on communication because they set boundaries in which communication occurs. When communicating, you must consider international and domestic laws, company codes of ethics and stakeholders' interests, and ethical frameworks and personal values. Learning to analyze a dilemma from both legal and ethical perspectives can lead to a solution that fits your personal value system. This figure shows the four areas where your decision might fit. The Pagano model in the textbook can help determine whether a proposed action fits into dimension four, where behavior is both legal and ethical. The following questions should be asked. Is the proposed action legal? What are the benefits and costs to the people involved? Should this action be a universal standard, appropriate for everyone? Does the action pass the light of day test? That is, if the action was televised or others learned about it, would you be proud or ashamed of the action? Does the action pass the golden rule test? That is, would you want the same to happen to you? Does the action pass the ventilation test? Ask the opinion of a friend with no investment in the outcome. Does this friend believe the action is ethical? Diversity challenges act as a strategic force on communication and occur on an international level as well as on the local level. As a communicator, you must consider the differences between you and your receiver, such as age, culture, gender, and education. International challenges. Worldwide telecommunications and intense international business competition have forced many industries to compete in world markets. Diversity skills will affect those industries' success in this global economy. Intercultural challenges. Today, the United States can be better described as a mosaic rather than as a melting pot. Changing demographics within the U.S. are requiring businesses to face a workforce with differing values, attitudes, and perceptions. Intergenerational challenges. Today, there are an increasing number of older workers than ever before. Changing retirement laws and better overall health have encouraged older workers to continue in their jobs. The different generations now working together have different perceptions, values, and communication styles. Gender issues. The flood of women entering the job market has substantially changed the American workforce. Old social patterns that defined male and female roles do not fit in a workplace free from discrimination. Barriers to intercultural communication include ethnocentrism. This occurs when people assume their own cultural norms are the right way to do things. Stereotypes. These are preconceived ideas of what people from a cultural or ethnic group are like. Interpretation of time. North Americans and Northern Europeans think time is money and value punctuality. Other cultures value long, casual conversations as a prelude to business. Personal space requirements. In the United States, we conduct casual conversations standing two to three feet from each other. People from other cultures may be more comfortable standing closer or further away. Body language. Basic gestures have varying cultural meanings. The American symbol for OK means zero in France, money in Japan, and a vulgarity in Brazil. Translation limitations. Even the best word-for-word -word translation can fail to express the cultural connotations of a message. Lack of language training. U.S. citizens are renowned for language illiteracy. If possible, people should learn a second language. However, those from other cultures will appreciate our efforts to learn even a few words. Changing technology acts as a strategic force on communication. 
Electronic tools have not eliminated the need for basic communication. They have even created new obstacles and barriers to communication that must be overcome. Technology has aided communication in the following ways. It has allowed great advances in data collection and analysis. Large amounts of data can now be organized with assurance of the data's integrity and security. Communication technology has helped create clearer and more effective messages. Document production is easier, faster, and is accomplished with professional results thanks to software for word processing, collaborative writing, graphics, desktop publishing, and presentations. Technology has overcome distance. Email, voicemail, fax machines, cell phones, and electronic conferencing have made the world of business a smaller world. For many, telecommuting has moved the office to their home. Legal and ethical issues have arisen with the new technologies. Copyright infringement and invasion of privacy are two common examples. Finally, team environment acts as a strategic force on communication. The team environment will be the standard pattern for the organization of the future, replacing the top-down management style more common in past years. A team is generally defined as a small group with complementary skills that works together for a common purpose. The team environment has paved the way for businesses to remain competitive in a global market. High-performance teams will benefit from synergy, the concept that increased output results from people working in groups rather than individually. In other words, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Open lines of communication between team members lead to increased interaction and communication between employees and management. Creativity is facilitated through the exchange of ideas and building on each other's ideas. Employees in a self-directed work team handle a wide array of functions and work with minimum direct supervision. What are the major benefits of these work teams? Work teams help workers feel that they are shaping their jobs, likely helping them feel more positive about their jobs. Work teams increase efficiency by eliminating layers of managers who once passed orders downward. Work teams enable a company to draw on the skills and imagination of the workforce. In the past, most businesses operated with decisions made by management at the top and passed downward. This traditional communication pattern is found in hierarchical structured organizations. Businesses that operate using team environments have different communication patterns. Trust building is the primary element that changes this pattern. Factors that help build trust are open meetings that educate employees about the business, shared leadership promoting effective communication between management and employees, listening, problem solving, conflict resolution, negotiation, and consensus among employees. Grouping employees into a team structure does not mean they will automatically function as a team. Groups need to go through a developmental process to become a team. Teams must learn to communicate effectively, the single most important aspect of successful team work. They must establish the three R's, roles, rules, and relationships, as well as learn other important skills, such as problem solving and goal setting, conflict resolution, distributed leadership, commitment to evaluate the group process continually, ability to understand the feelings and needs of co-workers, effective communication, ability to deal with barriers. A team must have a group understanding of the answers to these questions. What are our common goals? What roles are played by the group members? Does the group deal with conflict in a positive way? What aspects of the group process are going well? 
what aspects of the group process could be improved. 